Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for tying the time again to attend our November lunchtime lecture today. Uh, my name is Charlie Nicklin. For those who don't know me, I'm CEO of I Agree, and I'll be your host today. Um, I'd like to welcome Tim Chayman as our guest speaker today. I'm sure many of you will know Tim, but for those who don't, Tim spent 25 years at Silso in Ag Engineering Research, where he worked on tillage development and the soil and crop effects of machinery compaction. Since leaving Silso, Tim continued his quest for reducing soil damage by undertaking work with a variety of manufacturers and industry bodies. This included a six year field demonstration of controlled traffic farming, a subject and system which has continued in Tim's work to present day. So in today's lecture, Tim will be talking about the benefits of confining machinery compaction to the least possible areas of the field, how this is being achieved with existing machinery and how a changed mechanization could improve the efficiency with which this is achieved in the future. Uh, just before Tim starts, some house rules. Um, you're all currently muted by Sarah. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you so you can ask your question. So enough from me, over to you, Tim. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Charlie. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's, who's dropped by today. I um, really appreciate uh, the audience that uh, you're providing. So hopefully I can provide something new to, uh, to some of you. Uh, others, I think you find uh, you, you've seen this before, uh, or some of the slides before anyway. But um, hopefully, um, Sarah, if you can tell me that screen is now being shared and everybody can see it. That's perfect. Thank you, Tim. OK, well, yes, as Charlie said, I'm talking to the subject of controlled traffic farming, CTF for short, its benefits, implementation and its future. It's going to be a bit of a whistle stop talk because I I find it difficult to cut out the cut down the number of slides, but hopefully a lot of them are pretty simple and will be taken in fairly easily. So first, what is it? Well, as Charlie said, it's a system that confines all tracks to the least possible area of permanent traffic lanes. So it's it's more than just uh, tram lines. It's putting these tracks in place year in year out, same place, keeping them as confined as possible. So it's fairly simple what it's about. Achieving it, however, needs a bit more uh, thought and practice. Um, but why would we be going to control traffic? What are the benefits of it? What does it deliver to farmers? Um, and I think this shows what the situation is that we're in at the moment, that we have a very considerable mismatch between implements, wheel track gauges, wheels etc resulting in a massive coverage of the soil every season with growing every crop and depending on what sort of cultivation system you're using this can be anything from 85 percent covered or if you're in a, a vegetable rotation it's probably a hundred and hundred and odd percent cover each season if we cut down on tillage that perhaps drops to 65 percent of the area covered and direct drilling you'll drop it again but still 45 percent so still nearly half of the field every season is going to be covered by tracks and of course soils don't recover in just 12 months so you're going to put another 45 percent in next year and there's no guarantee it's going to be in the same place so the soil never really gets a chance to recover before you've run over it again so that's the reality of what we're having to do at the moment and what's the effect of that well this is something we don't see because it's well down in the profile, but if we look at soils research, it's all telling us that these vehicles, now they're getting so heavy, the impacts are getting deeper and deeper in the profile. And this um, histogram shows the predicted level of pressure in the soil, half a metre deep. So here in the 1930s, say, we're, I can't get my mouse to move, yeah. Here in the 1930s using horses, pretty low impact at less than sort of less than half a bar. Um, we then see the, the classic sort of Ferguson tractor being introduced and these tractors gradually getting bigger and heavier. And the only dip or the only dislocation of that rise 
is actually when you see here uh, radial ply tires were introduced so they immediately dropped the pressure at the surface which obviously had an impact at pressure at depth but we're now up to here 21 ton vehicles and more where we're now 1.8 bar compared with you know, less than one so this is happening on a massive scale unfortunately it's out of sight so we don't see it uh, and therefore we don't tend to react to it um, but it's there and uh, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, in the in the 1990s actually with um, the Swedish uh, group looking at what happened if they put uh, a, a single wheel load one year at the surface and what happened uh, over the following years and in fact eight years later they were still able to detect a two and a half percent reduction in yield as a result of that one wheeling applied in in, in a year eight years earlier so it, it does have a very lasting effect at that depth and it's not just confined to subsoils of course we're running on the surface and when we're doing milliman tillage as this is this is a, a disking operation on a, an Evesham series clay soil it looks great doesn't it it looks perfect on top the exact seed bed you'd want but unfortunately disturb that surface and you can't find any good soil structure there at all and that happens when soils are a bit moist in the autumn it can happen in the spring you can get a surface tilt but very poor structure underneath it's got no ability to absorb water it just runs between those massive clods and you know it, it can just then flood the surface. The control traffic, we actually turn that whole thing on its head. So instead of having 85% of the area tracked every year, we can actually have 85% without any tracking at all. And that's a nine meter system you see there. Those are the only wheel tracks that are there. And of course that's permanent. So they won't track anywhere else. That's so always there, won't affect the rest of the field. So what happens to soils and crops when we do a, a manage to get a control traffic system? Well, the evidence is, and, and the numbers on the right here against the different crops and the number of research results that these have been drawn from, the, the likelihood is your yields will increase. In fact, wheat down here at the bottom, is probably one of the most resilient uh, crops, probably because it's been bred for compaction, um, average about 8% increase in yield but other crops much more responsive, oats. Here we see on the other side, forage grass. That's a quite a dramatic increase in yield as a result of taking traffic away. So they're all positive responses. And when we don't compact the soil, run over it, they're a lot easier to work. And, and this is really what set me off in the early 1980s with a field trial on a clay soil. I just couldn't believe the difference spent 10 years working on developing cultivation machinery to overcome intract what we thought were intractable soils getting a tilt but they were only intractable because we were running all over them um, so you can see here with different depths of operation the savings in draft vary from anything from 60 percent at, at shallow tillage down to 18 percent and that actually is for a subsoiling operation so even at that depth we're, we're saving quite a considerable amount of of energy. Same with a shallow plough shown here at the, the uh, table at the bottom. The specific draft um, less than half compared with a, a trafficked conventional system and of course the energy input also lower. Um, this is uh, the results from one of the, the trials that we were doing on Asian clay. So we look at the energy inputs for a traffic situation. This was a, a spring sown crop of oats um, these were the operations. This was the result of sowing um, on the same day that the non trafficked was sown. And we, we just couldn't believe the difference. And so we went in and measured what was the depth of sowing. And actually, we couldn't differentiate between the two. So that's a, a, a dramatic reduction in energy input to establish the crop and actually a much more rapid establishment. So very positive outcomes from, from that. And less tillage has got other benefits. We'd, we know for certain that organic matter is a critical component of soils to make them more resilient, to improve their structure. 
And the evidence is that the more we cultivate them, and particularly if we do rigorous cultivation, we're tending to lose organic matter from that profile. So the less cultivation we can do, the better. Also, soil living animals don't like being knocked about and squashed. And there's a lot of evidence that earthworm numbers can be depleted quite dramatically by uh, severe compaction. So, and we generally recognize that they are um, the soil engineers and, and create porosity in soils. Um, soil structure itself, uh, again, evidence that the more tillage you do, the more destabilizing influence it has on soil structure. So soils under the impact of rain, for example, during the winter period, if they've, if they've had a lot of tillage, particularly soon after the tillage, they have rain, they can quickly lose structure as a result of that. Um, the other advantage, of course, if you don't need to do so much, you don't need to spend so much time in establishing crops. It makes the whole thing more timely, you can get more crops in at the right time. Um, and you're using less fuel. So your carbon emissions, and there's a lot of emphasis now on, on carbon neutral farming, that this has got to be good news in terms of fuel use, reducing that. Um, you, some of you have seen this little video before because it's, it's a classic, it's quite an old one now, but 2006 or something. Um, this is in a field that's been in no-till for three years with random traffic. It's an Eastern clay, it's December, so this clay soil is pretty moist. Um, it's probably nearing field capacity. But when I dug in there with my foot, I could not get that soil to come out at all. And, you know, you really imagine having that in your garden, trying to grow vegetables in that. Well, right next door, exactly the same place in the rotation, this field had been in control traffic for three years, had exactly the same treatments as the adjacent field, but now already after three years, we can see that soil has been transformed. The whole thing just lifts up beautifully easily and infiltration was much better on that soil. In terms of other outcomes of adopting controlled traffic, well, obviously if you don't need to do so much to the soil, you've got lower machinery costs, There's less power per unit width, smaller tractors, less aggressive, lighter machines. So the, experience of farmers who've gone into controlled traffic, they've sold a lot of power off the farm. They need less, less uh, fuel hungry uh, tractors. They still need to do some subsoiling on headlands because we haven't sorted that out yet. But in terms of overall, the subsoiling is, is pretty minimal um, compared with what they've been doing in the past. So a lot of savings from that. And overall about a 35% less fuel use from less draft and less need for tillage. So you've, you've got that um, massive saving in fuel. If we look at costs, then it's, it's quite difficult to do this. I have done a study looking at a farm that's converted to controlled traffic. It's quite a, a lengthy study, but I thought I'd look at NICS and see whether we can get some feel for what the difference in um, crop establishment costs are compared with RTF, random traffic farming. So we've got two there, traditional random traffic and min-till random traffic. And then we've got the min-till with control traffic and no-till with control traffic. If we look at the bottom two red lines there, then the percent saving of um, min-till compared with um, min-till random traffic compared with min-till control traffic, 60% saving. And, and likewise for, for no-till, big, big savings in costs. And this is borne out in practice. So farmers are just finding that their establishment costs have, have fallen dramatically. Another thing you don't think about so much is we talked about subsoiling just now. Well, subsoiling is an expensive operation. It's slow, it's power hungry. You need to do it in the right conditions and get the right result. And Julian Gold here, one of our control traffic farmers, um, made up this slide and said, well, actually it saves me a lot of time just thinking Am I going at the right depth? Have I got the right spacing? Is the moisture content in the soil right? All sorts of things that he doesn't really have to think about anywhere near as much as he used to in the past. So there, that's a big relief for him that he's, he's not got to think about this every year in different fields. If we look at uh, water use or water dynamics in um, controlled traffic systems, 
we see here the big effect of running over the soil with, with machinery. This was done in the Harper Adams soil hall. And you see the infiltration of water with no traffic is 23 or something like that. Um, but just one pass of a wheel drops that down to about four. And of course with two passes, three passes, you've done most of the damage in one pass in terms of infiltration, but it's dramatically reduced. And that's borne out in the field. Um, on average, if you look at research results from around the, around the world, there's a, about a four times increase in infiltration when you adopt a non-traffic non system. And, and that, that's an onion, there's an onion field that's been harvested in Tasmania. So, you know, quite a dramatic difference in, in water infiltration. And that also applies deep in the profile. We saw from one of the early slides that we are having an effect on subsoils. This doesn't actually have a controlled traffic comparison, but what it does is looks at different wheel loads. So we've got a four ton wheel load here, the blue, and a 10 ton, the, uh, the purple. And that's at 30, 35% centimeters depth, so quite a reduction there. And here in a different year, different place, quite a dramatic reduction from increasing the wheel load. That was some Swedish research from a few years ago. Um, other less tangible things, nitrogen. Um, we all apply nitrogen to our field soils. The last thing we want to happen to it is for it to be frittered away and go up in the air. Well, unfortunately, if you've got moist soils, you've got a reasonable amount of organic matter in them, and you've got waterlogging, the likelihood is you're going to lose a lot of nitrous oxide from that field. And work um, done, different researchers, including Dio, who is online now in Australia, um, you know, quite considerable savings uh, in, in terms of nitrous oxide, which, which is not only, of course, a loss to the farmer in terms of the nitrogen applied, but it's a very damaging greenhouse gas, about 300 times worse than, than carbon dioxide. So it's really something we don't want to be losing. We also get a methane flux as well that, that is negative with soil compaction. So quite a few benefits there and, and I'll just list those so that um, you can see them. And I think I've covered, covered most of those. Um, the infiltration I think is important because that initiates or stops happening uh, runoff and soil erosion, um, particularly damaging uh, to watercourses where you've got soil in, in, the, in, the, in the rivers, etc., and improve water use efficiency. Um, plants can actually access more water through the growing season, particularly when it's dry, because the water's not held so tightly in, it, as it happens in, in compacted soils, and less diffuse pollution, because more of the nitrogen is being used, for example, by the crop. So a lot of benefits there from primarily just avoiding damage. Um, so it's, it's not rocket science, it's just a fairly simple principle that I think we, all farmers should adopt as best practice if they possibly can. And if farmers tell you it's expensive, they haven't thought it through properly because with the right time scale and the right way of converting, you should just be shedding costs, not adding to them and, and lowering your long-term operating costs. So how do we actually do it in practice? Well, this is the one technology that's made it pretty simple to do in one respect. It has to be RTK, the real, real, I can't think of the word now, real-time kin kinematic. Um, uh, you can get a, an auto steer system to work on a geostationary satellite, which is, revolving over the, the equator, but it has ephemeris errors that mean that it's time dependent accuracy. So if you go down the field and then come back within 15 minutes, you're fine. You're probably plus or minus five centimeters. But if you come back a couple of hours later, there's no guarantee quite where you'll be. It could be half a meter out. So um, we need this real time kinematic correction, which is a ground based correction to actually get us to be able to auto steer to the exactly the same place year in, year out uh, to about plus or minus two centimeters. So a highly accurate system. 
you probably can't drive to that sort of accuracy manually, but you can do it with <coughs> with a correction like this. So satellite guidance and auto steer are key enabling technology for control traffic, making it simple. Step two, as you'd imagine, we've got to match everything up, implement widths and tr machinery track gauges. This is where it gets a bit more tricky and where you need to think long term. In Europe, it's, it's not practical really to try and match up the harvester track gauge, which tends to be sort of 2.8 to 3.2 meters track gauge, compared with tractors, which are often at 1.8 or just under two. So what we've done in Europe is adopt what we call an out-track system. So the harvester goes down its own track and then everything else uses that same center line but is in on a slightly narrower gauge. And the aim with this system is to minimize the track gauge of the harvester and maximize the track gauge of all the other vehicles. So you'll see in some of the control traffic systems we, we'll look at, they've got extenders on the, on the axle of, of tractors to try and get them up nearer to the harvester. So everything works on those same centers, chemical applications. And of course, there are direct multiple the chemical application of the base width of the narrower machines and the narrower machines all match up. So that's that's the main way that we do it in, in Europe. In Australia they have a everything is set on mostly on three meters because they've got a bit more space to do that than, than we have. Um, so here we are that that system we call OutTrack. Um, that's the most commonly used by farmers. We've got calculators so that farmers can actually just use a, an Excel file and calculate, well, with my machinery, my tires, my track gauges, what actually will I achieve um, with our common operation width of the implements? So you can see here we're going up from six up to 12 meters. And as you do that, so the tracked area in the last column here naturally comes down because the wider the machines, the, the lower the tracked area. Here's a nine, nine meter system in Lincolnshire, um, an out track system. And in fact, if you look carefully at the wheel tracks where the, the tractor is, you can just see where the harvest has been just on the outside of them. Here you can also see there are some axle extenders. Charlie will, Charlie Nicklin they will know about these. It's been a problem for JCB when they've uh, had them extended uh, inappropriately in Australia particularly. But um, that's a reality of, of, of a lot of the systems. And I think manufacturers now are recognizing that control traffic farmers need some assistance here to uh, try and match everything up more, more closely. This is an, an, a, a 10 meter system in Oxfordshire. And here again, you can see the harvester is delivering to the next wheelway in terms of this. So we need to see longer unloading orders in order that they can reach the tractor here. Um, it's also important that one tries to have a three times the base width implement to the tram line, because that enables, if you can imagine, it enables the tractor and trailer, the, the transport system to stay on tram lines, and obviously then less damage to the field uh, from, from the tra tracking of trailers, etc. This is another 10 meter system, um, quotes by the farmer here, obviously pretty pleased with, with how his has been going and he's matched up on a three times combine cutting width to his sprayer. Um, yeah, he, he makes an important point here is check machine dimensions before purchase. Um, the industry has got a bit um, lackadaisical about stating what operating width their machines are. So they might say six meters, but actually when you get down and measure it, it's only like 5.8. Well, that's absolutely no good at all for a controlled traffic system. It's got to be pretty much to the, to the right millimeter. So with combines, combines actually you do need them to be a bit wider to make sure you don't just miss a tiny bit of crop. So quarter of a meter is probably about enough extra width of the combine and then you steer it at whatever your your operating width is. Um, he's recorded lower inputs. Also that his land was dry, lying drier than it had been in the past. Headland management that, that acknowledges the fact that you do still have to do some subsoiling um, but we can start to think of other things because we've now got a soil condition which is much more amenable 
we can look at strip tillage, inter-row cropping, inter-row tillage for perhaps controlling weeds mechanically when situations arise. I mean, I, I've seen a, an inter-row hoe being guided very accurately by, by a vision system, but the soil condition was such that the, the thing couldn't get in the ground to actually do any work. So, you know, the soil conditions are critical to whether these machines actually work. And anybody doing a bit of vegetable gardening will know that when you hoe the, the soil in the spring, if you've walked all over it, hoeing is pretty ineffective. Whereas if you haven't walked on it, it works a treat. Um, so little things like that, you know, expanded to a, a field scale uh, is, is really a big advantage. Um, he's obviously wanting to, and this is typical, I think, of controlled traffic farmers. They start off somewhere, but then they're always striving to make it better, reduce the tract area if they possibly can. And um, so they, they get hit, hit by the bug. Um, this is typical of, of, of one of the, the ways of, of baling straw, which um, obviously is, is a challenge, but actually it's solved pretty simply. Um, so the baler drops the bale within the traffic lane, but then depending on the chasing system to pick the bales up, the bales need to be alongside the traffic lane. Well, that's been achieved simply just by putting a, a barrier, what motorway barrier or something simple on the front of the tractor and easing the, the, the straw sideways. And you'll see that in this um, video here. This is um, in Oxfordshire. And you can see the, the barrier here coming up, um, shifting the bale to the side. I have seen somebody with round bales doing this manually. Um, which is obviously I don't think sustainable for a great length of time, but um, he achieved it in one field, I certainly, because I saw him doing it. And, uh, so here, and, and there are a number of systems uh, of this nature, the bale chaser, that will allow farmers, uh, providing they get the bale in the right place, then it can be picked up very nicely. So we've now moved with nine, 10, we're now up to a 12 meter system, which is not quite the widest we know about. There is one at 13 and a half in Oxfordshire, but um, mostly they're up at 12. And uh, this farmer, Keith Challen, he's actually converted two farms to control traffic and is, is very happy the way things are, are going where he is now. Um, again, making the point that makes farming a lot simpler. Another thing to note here is that when you've got these wide systems and you're chopping straw, the need is to get that straw out to as great a width as possible to ensure you don't have problems with, with cultivation and sowing subsequently. So Keith has actually got a double chopper on his combine, and I think quite a few other farmers have, just to try and get that straw back out. But that's one of the limitations of combines as we know them at the moment. Um, some improvement could be could be on the books perhaps. James Peck at um, Cambridgeshire, he uh, admits to being a very happy farmer and a bit of a rare breed um, and you can read there he's, he's pretty happy with the way things are going. And he's been yeah he's gosh yeah 10 years now in, in control traffic and he's actually pushing the boundaries a bit. He's, he's now got potatoes onto a control traffic system and he's even carrying out his plowing um, on the land in a way that allows him to keep the traffic lanes if he can or, or not. Um, that, that's going to be quite a challenge. I haven't seen exactly how he's doing it, but that's, that's quite a challenge. But there he's um, bailing straw. I think he, he sends his straw off to a, a power station and the baler's working there alongside a trans stacker, which comes and collects the, the bales in the way that we just saw on the video. So far, we talked about out track. There are other options for matching track and implement gauges. And uh, this one was actually thought up soon after we sort of got into it at uh, Unilever many years ago where, by Lionel Shaw, who said, why, why can't you do this? So this is what we call twin track. So the harvester works on its own track here. And basically it's the harvester that creates the tracking in the field because all the other equipment just straddles adjacent passes of the harvester. 
So you can see that's a pretty simple system. It has its limitations in terms of implement width. Six meters is about the very maximum you can achieve with that system because the implement width, as you can see from that, is the addition of the two track gauges. So for example, if you have a th harvester on three meters, tractor on 1.8, your implement width is 4.8. And, and that actually can work quite well because it, it multiplies into a 24 meter tram line system. So for the smaller end of the, of, of the farming sort of market, then a, a twin track can work quite well. Um, you can see there all these other operations. You can see also Andrew has been rather clever the way he's done it because he's actually extended the track width of his harvester so that half of it is his track gauge of his tractors and that enables him to grow potatoes on a non-traffic soil. He hasn't yet sorted out the harvesting potatoes so it all goes pear-shaped then but at least he's presenting the potatoes with a non-traffic soil. So there's a lot of innovation going on. This is what it looks like in practice. Um, you can see you know, the wide track of the harvester and the narrower track of the tractors. Another option, add track. Um, this, I, I don't know anybody using this, but actually it's, it's a pretty simple system other than the fact that when you come to auto steer, you're gonna to have to have two AB lines for each field because they're going on. Or you, you could, I, I guess, just put an offset into your tractor system or, or combine, whichever is the simpler. So it's, it's not, not that difficult, but it's a, it's a pretty simple operation. We now come through to the vegetable industry. And, and here you see um, Barfoots in Hampshire. Um, they've invested heavily in control traffic. They're on a five meter system, contract. So all their, their tractors are on the same common track. And uh, yeah, they, they, these, these aren't photographic duplications. There are actually four of these machines that they've got there. Um, so they've made a big investment in that. Onion harvesting, so we're on the veg again. This is a local farmer, parishes in, in, in Shefford, um, near Shefford rather. And uh, just a, a video showing this system, how it works and how they've gone from their old harvester here, which um, you'll see from the, as, as this progresses that this wheel that is supporting the elevator because it's set out to the this wheel is running right in the middle of their bed. So what they've done, Jones have um, modified a, one of their harvesters and you see now the wheel is, is actually sitting right on, on one of the traffic lanes. They were operated on quite a narrow track. They're on 1.8 meters. So their tracks are all 1.8 meters apart. Um, and the tracked area is obviously going to be quite large on occasions, but you can see here, um, there are, you know, significant areas of the field left non-tracked and if they can go from one of these systems with a little bit of tickling of the sides of the traffic lanes um, then they can maintain a, a fairly low traffic area and real real benefits they've haven't eliminated plowing from their operations but they are doing much more without plowing and uh, meaning that they can save a lot on the, on their inputs to create uh, onion seed beds, which classically require a fair bit of tillage. Anyway, that's uh, something they're doing. Um, Adrian, who, who's worked on the farm, and, and a lot of you know well, Paul Cripsy, at Adley died a few years ago. He was a great advocate of, of controlled traffic, uh, really innovative. You can see here, Adrian just dug into the non-traffic bit, uh, compared with here, where the fork is taking quite a bit of effort to push into the soil. He's almost breaking the fork to get it out. And when he does throw it on the ground, you know, a lot more clods in, in that sample than, uh, than on the, the previous fork probably took out. And I say to any farmer, if you want to find out a bit about your soil, go and use a fork, not a spade. You get a lot better feel for it. This just shows the engineering of that extended wheel track. Um, I think the, these two bars come out, obviously. There's a, a plate here that is hydraulically driven down to the ground, lifts the whole side of the harvester up 
and then the wheel is slid back in to its, its normal slot in the side of the harvester. Obviously after having parked the elevator so that it, the whole machine doesn't tip over. So fair bit of hydraulics going on there as you can see. And of course contrived vac is not just for cultivated soils. This was a, a photograph I took in Yorkshire some years ago. Uh, happened to be on this farm, staying on this farm, and a week later took this photograph. And you can see you know, tr tremendous impact of wheels on the regrowth of that grass crop. Not, not good. Um, it constrains the grass, it means it differential uh, rate of growth, uh, and just you know, not, not a positive outcome. Um, recently done some, some work for, for some Norwegian uh, group looking at how they could actually create systems of CTF for grass production where they're actually wrapping the grass uh, in, into plastic bales. So it's surprising you can come up with some ideas as to how they can do it by just simple little things like a deflector for the bale. When you pick up wrapped bales you have to be rather more careful than you do with straw. You can't afford to push them along the ground. So there is one system where as this bar contacts the bale, the whole bar shifts backwards at the same rate as the tractor is going forward until such time as it's lifted clear of the soil. And then it, uh, then it moves with, with the whole unit and stacks it automatically on a trailer. Um, there are in Denmark um, and Netherlands, I think, 12 meter control traffic systems for grass forage. And this is a particular advantage where you've got three, four cut systems, because you can do a lot of damage um, in early spring for particularly and in moist conditions, you can cut back the, the grass. So that's a little bit of a, a sort of a glimpse of what's going on. There's a, there's a lot more to tell obviously, but uh, I haven't got much time. So what's happening now in terms of existing systems? Well, I think, the machinery industry is uh, sort of recognizing the fact that there is a, a commercial uh, advantage with uh, getting things to be more compatible. So harvesters, etc., and implement widths, trying to make sure at least that they are compatible with control traffic systems. Um, closer matching of harvester and, and tractor gauges. Uh, as Charlie was telling me a little while back, it, JCB have, have actually increase the strength of their axles so that farmers in Australia who want to go to three meters can do so and, and not um, compromise their warranties. So um, that's one thing that can be done. And on a more modest scale, I think, uh, I think John Deere offer a, a, an axle extension up to about 2.2 meters. So things are going on to make it a little bit easier for farmers to get into it and, and keep their track systems um, tracked areas down. So looking just briefly at the, at the future, and I, I saw this machine, I don't know how they pronounce this, but I call it C.run. Um, and I feel sad that they've missed an opportunity here. So it's an autonomous vehicle. Um, it goes out in the field by itself, it sows the field, it does whatever you want in the field. But look what they've done. They've got a pretty heavy bit of kit here, 18 tons, and if you look at the wheels, they're not that big, so they're about two and a half bar, 2.6 bar tire pressure in them, so pretty high pressure tires. They've got a nine meter implement width here, but where have they put the wheels? Right in the middle of the cropped area, um, and you know, it, if you see a video of this machine working, They've even got um, uh, road going vehicles in the field and you, you, your dick will know we've been in Australia and, and you know, it's just a no no to run a, um, an Arctic in, in the field because of high pressure tires. So it's saddening that here, this farmer invention, um, they don't seem to care about their soils. They just, they're, I don't know, treat them like dirt, as I say. <laughs> um, however, if we go on to the true concept of widespan or gantry tractor, then here we see something that has, I believe, and I believe this since 1981, that it's got enormous potential that just hasn't been tapped. Um, 
is so flexible this machine and it's well hopefully you'll you'll see um go to a, the, the website that shows it working but um because one thing you've got with this you're using the same wheel track twice so for every implement width instead of getting two wheels you've only got one so tracked areas of maybe around six percent are quite feasible and six percent you start to think well actually I could engineer those wheelways so that I don't crop them, but they give me pretty much year round access and I can I can treat my soils very, very lightly indeed because I've got a highly controllable um, platform from which to work. And uh, it, at Silso in the 1980s, we did a lot of work with this machine. I remember sitting on this machine first, 12 meter wide cultivator, we had a 66 horsepower engine. And okay, we didn't go rapid, very rapidly across the field, but by golly, having done 10 years before that, looking at how we could improve our management of being what I thought were intractable soils, I got on this machine, I thought, what on earth are we messing about at? This has got to be the right way to manage our field machinery, to manage our soils in the most sensitive way possible. And it has great flexibility because with existing control traffic systems, if you do need to plow, and there'll be occasions when you might want to do that, you, it's really difficult to maintain any width of control traffic. Whereas with a gantry system, here we had two, two furrow plows, um, one left hand and one right hand, and we just worked across each plot and then moved the, the, the plows to, to finish off. And then next year, if you were plowing, you'd obviously swap these two around. So what you've pushed to the outside one year, you pull to the middle of the next. The other beauty of this is, although we're not running on soils, we do still need to firm them. And this was a very lightweight roll with hydraulic uh, pressure regulation from the tractor seat. So you could firm the soil very precisely to the level you wanted, just by transferring weight from the gantry to the, to the rolls. So they were actually hollow rolls, so they had no weight in them, but you could push them down quite quite dramatically. And of course, with the soil being in a more amenable condition, you got much better firming and more even firming than you do with, with rolls in a traditional system. Harvesting is, is probably one of the biggest challenges to get onto a, a, a gantry type system, but equally it could provide the greatest opportunity and innovation for change. As I mentioned earlier, harvesters are fine, but they've not changed much over the last 50, 60, however many years. We've gone to these really wide machines now that have a challenge. First, they bring this material from 12 meters into about two, try to get separation through a drum and concave and walkers and whatever. And that, of course, is a challenge because you've got a lot of material going through a narrow space that is governed by road width not by the needs of the crop or whatever. You then, if you're not gonna use the straw other than re-spread it, you've got the challenge of spreading it out again. So any systems that can actually just replace that, and there are some around that are being worked on, unfortunately not as, as much investment as I think should be in this is to um, get a completely different harvesting system that actually overcomes some of these things and would feed into creating one that would fit on a, a wide span machine. Um, this is in, in Denmark, 9.6 machine, um, elevating onions. You can see what things not going quite right there. That's not quite in the right place. Um, so that, that's being developed. This machine went and visited the, the machine a few years ago. Um, it changed from its onion elevating mode to cultivation mode within about an hour by two guys um, changing the main frame between between the wheels. So it's a sort of an implement carrier almost. Goes on the road uh, lengthways um, and uh, driven fairly conventionally because it steers at both ends. So it's quite a narrow vehicle, you know, quite a short vehicle in reality. Um, yeah, so, so finally, I think, you know, this is summarizing some of the benefits of the wide span system compared with traditional practice. And I've been through those, the ability to plow, Implements can be very cheap. We had a very cheap a 12 meter wide cultivator 
two of you could lift up four meter, a three meter component of that. There were that light because they're supported all across the frame. It's got a built in guidance system. If your guidance system falls over, all you're doing is following the wheel track and you start, you're sitting right over it. It's nice and stable. It's a wide machine. Chemical applications can be more precise. It can deal with offset loads. So although I've shown it plowing with two, two equally sized plows, we can actually plow with one plow and right up to one end of the machine. As long as you have traction capability to one end, it will work perfectly stably. Um, and it, it improves traction through its integrated weight that sits over all wheels. So there's a lot, of, a lot going on there. Overall summary, um, not sure it's worth me going through those in details, but uh, in detail, but um, I think there's a lot of positive deliveries from control traffic. And uh, I, I'm, I'm saddened that CDF actually seems to be the elephant in the room. You hear people talking about soil protection, you hear agronomists talking, and nobody seems to mention CTF, and you think, what's wrong with you? It's such a simple thing, perhaps. It doesn't need much research, it just needs putting into practice. It's, it's simple, and it's fundamental. If you're carrying out um, precision farming on your farm, and you've not introduced controlled traffic, then it's a complete anathema. It makes no sense if you're trying to do precision things, but then introducing uh, variability through tracking all over the place. It doesn't make any sense. So I, I find it, it, it a bit frustrating, but here we are. <laughs> um, okay, if you want to draw in the farmer network now, it's being run by NIAB in Cambridge. Um, if you just search on either of those, um, I'll also encourage you, where did I put it there? Do, do have a look at um, the Gantry Tractor website, which I've put together over the last 12 months. Um, we're interested in any reactions to that. But uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, that's it for me. Um, and hopefully we'll have a few questions as to, um, yeah, stop sharing. Okay, back live. There you go, I've changed the picture just for you, Tim. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> that's, that's Australia, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been involved in it for, for a good number of years, actually, with the Australians. Um, and right. I think if I was commercially farming, I would definitely be using controlled traffic because it's just an utter no-brainer to me. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, the investment, you talk about investment, Really, if you're careful with your machinery purchases and you use a bit of common sense, it's not heavy on investment either, is it? It's not. I mean, you, you should actually be saving massive amounts. It's not yeah. good for the machinery industry because you'd be saving a lot of money. You're selling I mean, power off the farm. Clearly, clearly driving around at three metres doesn't work very well in Europe and the UK, yeah. like you say, but, you know, multiples of two metres works a treat. Yeah, um, so yeah. I, I really don't know why people don't know it more. I mean, the, the picture there is Australia, which is running on cotton reel spaces. Yes. So they can at least take the cotton reels off and put the track back to normal and then sell the tractor in the future. Right. Uh, unlike some oh. of the conversions that, that we saw many years ago out there. So, oh. the nice yeah, thing really, really they, interesting. The nice thing would be they couldn't sell it back into conventional practice because everybody's gone to control traffic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, I, 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 we had customers... Well, they had, JCB had customers in Australia that were spraying at 40 kilometers an hour Great. on three yeah. meter track widths with, uh, with RTK yeah. guidance. And it was, yeah. it's unbelievable. You wouldn't, you couldn't believe it when you watched it, spraying yeah. at 40 K, it was incredible. Right. And the, the yeah. amount of ground they covered. Yes, yes. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you might have a field that's got a 12 kilometer run on one bout. So right. it, it's yeah. just incredible, incredible. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've got a few questions. Um, right. William, do you want to unmute yourself? Ask your question. Yeah. Am I there? Yeah. Okay. Um, you. This controlled traffic is great. I'm sold on the art concept. The bit that I worry about is some soils. You're going to get phenomenally heavy, deep grooves 
by driving on the same place all the time. Um, isn't that going to be causing beautiful parallel streams across the field to encourage runoff, which was well, back to the last lecture? Yeah, yeah. Quite honestly, that, that was something that I was worried about when we first started on this. It, if you look at um, comparison between Australia and here, Australia is predominantly dry with occasional wet. I think in Europe is mostly wet with occasional dry. But what actually turned out is that very often the rutting is caused by going from, for example, a plow system direct to control traffic, where you've got a quite a, a loose topsoil. So you've got a lot of ruts, ruts occur in the first year. The critical thing is, is actually to be prepared for that, depending on where your starting point is. If you've been in men till or no till and you move to control traffic, that issue is, is less um, apparent in the first years. The other critical thing to do is to have a mechanism in place where in the first year or two, you ensure that you bring soil into that wheel track. And with our system, we actually just had a, the first one we, we tried on, on an Eastern clay, we just had a, a tine drill and we put a, a, like a harrow on the back of it. And actually after six years, you could barely pick out the wheel tracks post harvest. So that fear was largely didn't didn't come about. There were, however, obviously wet spots in fields where you would get rutting. And it's a matter of don't expect wet spots to disappear when you go into control traffic system. If you've got an underlying drainage problem, you need to sort it before you go into control traffic. But in the main, rutting is not a big problem. Um, the Australians have come out with some machines for basically covering them in, just, just filling them in. Um, and I think that that's the main approach. That if you if you have a bit of a rut, don't go and dig them up, just fill them in. And the, the reality is that over time, they actually become less of a problem. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, I can understand that fear, but the reality is it doesn't seem to be that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Newbold, live from Poland. You have a question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, just actually, just a comment on William's question. Um, when we went round Julian Gold's farm a couple of years, Tim, he had a, a tram line rejuvenator, didn't he? Which was basically yes, a yeah. glorified McConnell shaker, to, where he'd taken bits and pieces off and left, left tines in place exactly where the tram lines were. So it just allowed him to lift his tram lines up. So if you, if you felt that your permanent wheelings were getting a bit down, you could you could lift them up and rejuvenate them so that so that you didn't end up with with banks all across the field. Uh, not that that was my question, I hasten to add, but I just the, the thought dropped in my head then after that that day we had there, Tim. Um, I was interested in <clears throat> what's the way into CTF if you're working in a conventional traditional crop establishment system with random traffic, Tim. Um, again, long-term planning, I think is. Um, is to get in there at the right stage. Um, I think it's unrealistic to consider subsoiling all your fields before you go in. Um, I think you would look at any fields where you know you've got problems and run a subsoiler through those, um, preferably not in the same direction in which your traffic lanes are going to go. So you do those that make sure you're at an angle to where you're putting the traffic lanes in and be prepared in that situation to be creating some ruts when you when you establish the system. Um, I don't think there's any right or wrong time to establish it. I think it's, uh, as um, Don Yule would say, just do it. Um, you'll, you'll find out whether you've done it right or not <laughs> fairly soon. But um, the main thing is just to go in and, and give it a try and, and, and get going. But you do need to have thought through all your machinery beforehand, um, make sure that it's a fairly logical place in the in the rotation to do it. Some people introduce it at harvest, which is which is a good idea because the harvest is the, the key vehicle in terms of compaction. So once they've done the harvesting operation, that then is set up everything for um, going in and, and drilling. Um, I don't know if that adequately answers you. I, my problem is I've never actually done it myself in practice. <laughs> so. Um, relying on, on, on farmers um, 
making their own decisions about that. That's exactly how they do it. That's great. Thank you, Tim. Um, okay, Harry Henderson. Hello, Hello yeah, Harry. Sure. Get, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Just get myself off off mute. Um, yeah, Tim, a, a great presentation. Um, Thank I, you. I, we've seen each other uh, present to each other before, I'm sure, but I do feel that we're we're you're probably presenting to the converted um, to <laughs> yeah. the gang that are already online. I what something that vexed me, and you're quite welcome to say, well, back at you, kid. Um, is it the role of the Institute to get in front of the people in, in government that make the decisions on how the UK is going to look after its soils and make them aware of such, te such technologies? Because they, um, I think they get a little bit overly influenced on that no-till is the one and only answer and that will solve all our ills. And I, yeah, you know, I think yeah. they need the horizons widening a little bit that there is other options for... Um, for, for other types of farming. But um, yeah. I don't know how we can get in front of these guys. No, I, I would absolutely agree, Harry. I, I, you really need to get into public fakers and movers who can make things happen. And I, I have tried, I've been to the Houses of Parliament um, where they've had meetings on occasions. I've even tried to have a word with Rebecca Powell and um, <laughs> I was given pretty short shrift, I have to say. <laughs> She's quite a formidable woman, but um, yeah, I think we just need to keep trying, Harry, um, and, and putting it in front of people. And the institution, yeah, if the institution is, is behind it and um, uh, can support us in that role of, of getting to government and, and saying, well, look, here is actually something that's, that most farmers can adopt. And even the, the West Country farmers, are, if, if they could adopt these systems much more easily than they realise, and uh, it would have massive benefits for them. So. Yeah, any ideas, Harry? I'd be very happy to support you and, and anybody else who, who thinks they've got a, a, a way in to actually make a difference. I did think some years ago when a number of us, um, the James Hutton Institute and others, we put together a cost benefit analysis of different compaction mitigation systems. And, you know, control traffic came out pretty much top of the line all the way across and that was funded by DEFRA but they took no action on it. We thought maybe as a result of that they would introduce some sort of incentive for in introducing control traffic on farms but they did nothing. So yeah, it's a bit, bit uh, di disheartening when that sort of thing goes on. Yeah if yeah. anyone has any leads then then send them along. Yeah yes yeah and uh, yeah, I, I, again, my, my passion, again, since 1981, has been in, in wide track systems. I, I just cannot understand why manufacturers haven't grasped it and said, right, let's, let's run with this. I mean, JCB grasped the, the fast track, the, the, you know, the fast tractor principle, and then made it commercial reality that people recognize for the, for the you know, superb system that it is. Well, I think it only needs somebody of that or a company of that nature who, who's convinced that this is the right way to go can make it happen. It's, it's, it's engineering at its best. Um, and it, it could be so versatile, you know, tractor units, uh, mass produced end units who is span between them can be whatever you like. Um, but these mass produced pods, as you might call them, um, would form the basis of, of systems that could be five meters, 10 meters, 12 meters wide. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, an engineering possibility. No, no, no big issue in that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Tim Reynolds. Tim, Tim. he's asking about Tim. Um, I think Tim may have had to have left, left the meeting. Oh, so yeah, his question. Have you, have you seen his question? Yeah, I can see it here now, uh, uh, Charlie. Um, okay. Asking if he's aware of any scheme using furrows for the wheelings like potato ridges or ancient ridge and furrow. Um, I can't, can't say I, I am. Um, what, what does worry me a bit is 
where you are creating beds for potatoes, for example, or, or even onions. Um, very often the tractors, are, the machines are running quite low in the profile, making subsoil compaction even more of a risk. And, and that's again a, one benefit I see of the wide track is that you can keep the, everything well above the, the subsoil. And, but equally you can create the deep beds that you need to without compromising subsoils. So uh, yeah, but I haven't seen any, anything of that nature. I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah. Okay. I think we, we are about out of time. We've got, we have Claire has one question, which we might just be able to squeeze in, can we Sarah? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I just wondered, Tim, whether the, the push now towards zero carbon, it might, the control traffic, tra control traffic farming might now have its time about to come, because if, if, um, if we need less power, um, surely it's one of the ways of doing it. Well, absolutely, Claire. I couldn't agree more. I, mean, I think it's just, you know, it's begging to be taken up by farmers, to be supported by governments be supported by industry because it just it doesn't have many negative outcomes um, unfortunately it's perceived as being expensive and difficult but it just needs a little bit of thought and time and, and it can be put together and made to work very well indeed um, so yeah I, I hope that this um, zero carbon farm farming will be maybe the catalyst to make it work a bit you know, to be taken up more more widely yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we're about we're about uh, out of time now. So um, I really want to thank Tim for taking time out to present today. Um, I find it incredibly interesting as I did back when I first learned about it, um, and it, it seems not a no-brainer to me, to be honest. Um, and as we've said before, I don't see a massive investment, especially when you're working at two meter track widths for sort of European equipment. Um, so before we close, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and hope you will join us for our next lecture on the 15th of December. Uh, I guess that's classed as the Christmas lecture. So that's where Paul Henderson will be talking to us about the little known pioneering genius, Frederick Lancaster who developed many world firsts and hundreds of patents that we see on vehicles today. Uh, so please see the website and get booked in and spread the word. We've got lunchtime lectures running into next year now. We've got um, bookings up to March so far, so they're certainly proving very popular. So thanks again for everybody. and We'll see you all next time. <laughs>